we are pretty close to seven oh seven oh one <laughs> so i think uh i think that we will get started this evening so uh, i want to thank everyone for joining us tonight um we are going to be doing a webinar on climate change in the hudson valley so this is part of uh, a series an ongoing series that we're going to do we're going to try to do with as many of these on this topic as possible so it's a nice webinar series on climate climate change. Um, if you missed it last fall, uh, Mohawk Preserve presented a virtual climate change panel discussion um, that took place in September. Um, it was with Kevin Case, our president and CEO, and Julia Solomon, who is the director of conservation programs, Andrew Randazzo, who is a research associate, and Raina Berger, who was our land and climate intern last year. Um, that presentation was a really great discussion that was about a little more than an hour with time for questions. Um, it was recorded and and uh, if you missed it and you're interested in viewing it, the recording is available on our website, along with all of the other virtual recordings that we've done. So you can check out other topics um, like mushrooms and forest bathing and all kinds of great things. Um, but we'll continue to do more of these um, programs on climate change as well as part of a series. So this evening's topic is on climate change in the Hudson Valley. Um, and my name is Lauren Bohr. I should introduce myself. I'm the Education Coordinator for Public and Youth Programs at Mohonk Preserve. I will be one of the people presenting this evening. Um, I'll also be facilitating, so I'll try and keep my eyes on the chat as much as possible while I'm presenting. Um, but I'm also, I have a co-presenter this evening is Penny Adler Colvin. She's our Community Science Coordinator. So she's gonna do a nice introduction in just a moment here. But before we do all of that, just a couple of reminders for this evening. Um, if you have questions during the presentation, you can use the chat. Um, if you could just pop a question in there, we will have time at the end of the program um, for those questions. So if you think of something during the presentation and you're worried you're going to forget it, um, you can type it in the chat as a question and we'll pick it up at the end of the program. Um, at the end of the program, too, you might notice um, that with the chat, you also see a little hand that says speak. If you click on that, um, I can accept you. And if you're not as fast or comfortable as getting your thoughts down um, in typing, then you can use that function and you will be able to ask us directly the question. So with video and chat, you'll be able to ask a question that way. So, um, so you can do it with um, the video and you can also do it with the chat in, on the side there. So this presentation is going to be recorded. It will be available online. So if you um, have to cut out early or uh, maybe you are joining us watching this as a recording or you just want to revisit it later, um, it will be made available uh, shortly. So before the end of this week, even maybe before the end of tomorrow, it will be available. I will send links to everyone who is registered um, and I will be posting it on our website as well. So it'll be all there for you. So I'm gonna introduce myself and then I'm gonna let um, Penny uh, introduce herself as well. So again, I'm Lauren Borer and I am the Education Coordinator for Public and Youth Programs at Mohonk Preserve. I've been with the Preserve for two years now, um, but previously I spent 14 years working as a naturalist and a teacher in Minnesota. Um, and I have more than 20 years experience in environmental ed. And I've been teaching all ages um, from elementary school all the way on through adults um, about climate change for more than five years, both in the classroom and out in the field. Um, it is a passion of mine to educate people about the science behind it and uh, to give some ways that they themselves can combat climate change. So I'm going to let Penny introduce herself before we get going tonight. Thank you for that, Lauren. Hi there. I'm Penny Adler Colvin. I am the Community Science Coordinator here at Mohonk Preserve. And I've been working at Mohonk Preserve pretty consistently since about 2018. I've worked in a variety of different departments, including land protection, stewardship, education, and conservation science. And like I said, I'm now the Community Science Coordinator. And in that position, I interact with a lot of our volunteers who help with our programs that help with initiatives like climate change, for example. And I'm excited to be here with you all tonight. 
Yay. <laughs> All right. So I think without further ado, we can get right into our presentation. We have a lot of information to give um, and we also want to have time for questions at the end. So we'll get going on our climate change and the Hudson Valley webinar. Just so you can see the whole screen, I'm going to cut out my camera for just a moment here. So first, I think that we should kind of differentiate what is the difference between weather and climate. So weather is the atmospheric conditions of a specific place at a specific point in time on a local scale. So you can think of it as weather is what's happening outside. So today it's raining or today it was windy and cold, right? Climate is how the atmosphere behaves over relatively long periods of time. So months, years, decades. We were talking lots and lots of information here, decades long. Um, this is reported as an area's average weather conditions over a long period of time. So we're looking at weather averages, compiling all that data and putting it into long-term uh, information. So climate is what has been happening outside over a long period of time. So the main difference between weather and climate is this difference in time. Weather is what's happening today. Climate is what on average happens during a set period of time. So you can also think of it is <laughs> as weather is what you're wearing today. So we don't have any snow right now, but there I am snowshoeing all happy. Um, so weather is what's happening outside today and climate is what you have in your closet. Um, so it could be you've got your summer clothes and your winter clothes all in one place. So you can think of it that way. Weather is how I'm going to go outside, how, what I'm going to wear outside today. And climate is I have everything available right here in my closet. <laughs> so this information um, really comes down to getting a lot of averages over a long period of time. So here's a little graph on uh, the global average temperature. Um, from 1850 until just this last year. So we're talking about these trends and what is a trend? Um, a trend is the long-term increase or decrease in data. So we can look at climate data and notice that with each decade of data, the average global temperatures are rising as seen in this graph here. So within the data set, there's always going to be some variation. And you can also see that in this graph here, there's some high peaks, there's some low valleys. The variation represents weather when major storms or events affect the data. So it could have been a really hot year one year, but we had really cold um, another year. So there are some interesting facts that we have been able to get from this global average temperature. Um, last year, 2021, was the sixth warmest globally on record since we've been keeping track of this data. 2020, the previous year, was the second warmest year out of the 141 years of record keeping. So we, and you can see this from the graph here, the trend is that our global temperatures, average temperatures, are getting warmer and warmer, and we've had some of the warmest years in very recent years. All right, so there's um, 11 signs of climate change that the Environmental Protection Agency has put together. Um, as these global temperatures continue to trend upwards, our planet are showing signs of this increase in temperature changing our local climates and in, in fact affecting our local weather. So here are the 11 signs of climate change from the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. The first one is the weather patterns, um, changing rain and snow patterns. So weather patterns see a change in the amount of rain or snow, depending on which part of the world you live in, that regions receive. Some can get too much rain and snow, um, while others don't get enough. So you might get extreme flooding in some places, or you could get long-lasting droughts in another. Another um, sign of climate change are these stronger storms. So storms like hurricanes becoming stronger and more frequent as the average temperatures rise globally. Uh, we've seen an increase in the number of these storms each season. Uh, some regions will see several large storms a season now. Um, and storm seasons are becoming longer as well. We used to always say like uh, June 1st would be when um, hurricane season starts, but we've actually been seeing that uh, the potential for hurricanes 
hurricanes is creeping closer and closer and closer um, into May. Like there's still there's a possibility now that we could be seeing hurricanes hitting uh, areas in May. So higher temperatures and more heat waves, which makes sense when we're talking about climate change and, and global warming. So globally, the average temperature is rising. It means that on average, the winters are not as cold and the summers are warmer. So this heats up the land and the ocean, and that will lead to larger storms and the changing weather patterns. See, this is all connected. What else happens is that as our planet warms, uh, the thawing permafrost is, is, an, is an issue. I can speak correctly. So the permafrost, that's the land that never thaws. So, uh, you know, up in Canada and northern regions in Europe and Asia, um, this thawing is due to the warming temperatures and the lack of ice that's there to reflect the sun's heat back into the atmosphere. Um, indigenous cultures that have lived in the Arctic for thousands of years, they're losing their ancestral communities to the thawing permafrost. The lack of sea ice and, uh, and some of these indigenous communities have actually become climate change refugees. They can no longer live in their areas um, because the ground is thawing and homes are actually sinking into the earth. So less snow and ice is another sign of climate change. Um, as the earth warms, the amount of snow and ice in the Arctic, on the mountain peaks, um, glaciers, and anywhere that typically sees snowfall has become less and less. Uh, the winter snow insulates tree roots, uh, replenishes streams and rivers in the spring from all that snow melt, and reflects heat back into the atmosphere, as I said before. So without that snowpack, the land will warm more and stay dry longer. Um, and we've already said that that is impacting uh, what happens with storms and things like that. So everything is connected here. Another sign is the warming of our oceans. So warmer air temperatures means that the oceans, the lakes, the stream waters will also get warmer. Um, this will harm the plants. Uh, fish and other animals that are adapted to the colder water and they cannot tolerate any of these warm water conditions. The warmer ocean waters will also fuel the larger storms like the hurricanes, causing them to be, uh, become stronger and more intense and in fact more frequent if we have this warmer water all the time. So another issue, of course, we're talking about snow melt. Well, where does that all go? It's going to end up eventually into our oceans. So as the snowpack and glaciers melt and the oceans warm, the melting Arctic and Antarctic ice, the sea level, of course, is going to rise. Uh, coastlines are already being lost and some islands are no longer inhabit inhabitable as they are now underwater Again, creating climate change refugees. There are some uh, Pacific islands where there's very little land left and um, people have fled um, and come to different parts of the world, of course, but there are actually some climate change refugee areas in Missouri of all places um, where Pacific Islanders have found homes. Um, and going along with our water theme here, there's damage to our corals. So some of the excess carbon that's in the atmosphere from the burning of fossil fuels, it's going to end up in the oceans. Um, these large bodies of water, they're carbon sinks. So that means just means that they're absorbing a lot of carbon from the atmosphere and they're storing it. So they're not just hanging there, they're not just using it, it's, it's being stored there in our oceans. So that excess carbon is going to react with the minerals that are in the ocean water, and it's gonna actually create an acid called carbonic acid. Um, and of course, you've probably heard of ocean acidification. So the carbonic acid, it is an acid, and it's going to um, harm the ocean life, including the sensitive coral reefs that create incredible ocean biodiversity. And you may have seen, clips out there of whole stretches of coral reefs that are just dead. They've been bleached. Um, there's nothing living in them. Um, coral actually is built by these little creatures, these little polyps. So they are actually a living community. It looks, they look like plants, but, but they have little, little animals that live in them. So we also have 
a lack of precipitation, which causes more droughts and wildfires. Um, this has really been in the news a lot in the past several years. Um, so the changing weather patterns, the lack of adequate precipitation in some places, meanwhile, others get floods, but in some places, if you don't get enough precipitation, you're going to get droughts. Um, and they last longer than average. Um, so these warm, uh, dry periods dry out the entire landscape and basically makes a giant tinderbox. So the droughts dry the landscape and they really increase the likelihood of wildfires. And in many places, wildfire season is no longer just a season. In some places, it's a year round threat. Um, so it's not just like, oh, the, you know, this is the dry season. And so we have to be careful for wildfires. It's all the time that you have to be careful of watching out for wildfires. So we also have these changing weather patterns are going to be causing um, altered seasons. So season spring that comes a little bit earlier, summer that lasts a little bit longer. So it's going to impact the growing seasons of plant communities. Um, plants will bloom sooner and they'll fruit sooner. And our agricultural systems will need to shift um, to accommodate these changing growing seasons. And we've already seen that. There are already um, farmers who are shifting when they plant or even shifting what they plant based on the climate. And finally, with all these changing plant life cycles, the animals also are going to have to make a shift. So their migration patterns will need to shift due to the changing reliability of food. So they're probably relying on insects, they're relying on fruit, they are relying on flowers. So the migration patterns are determined by the change in the length of daylight, um, which is not at all impacted by climate change. So the length of the day is not going to change based on how warm the atmosphere is. It's going to stay the same. The growing seasons have changed, so the animals will need to change their migration patterns to find food and nesting sites. Um, but again, their cues are coming from the length of the day and not necessarily the temperature. They don't know that while they're down in South America, they don't know that things have already started blooming here and that they should leave. They're basing everything on the length of the day. All right, I'm going to turn this on over to Penny. Thank you, Lauren. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the Daniel Smiley Research Center and our data collection at Mohonk Preserve. So Mohonk Preserve's environmental data collection on the ridge goes back over a century. Our origins start with the Smiley family. Albert and Alfred Smiley purchased Mohonk Lake and the surrounding area in 1869. In 1963, Keith and Dan Smiley, along with other friends of Mohonk, established the Mohonk Trust, a non-for-profit land trust with goals related to the family's long-held land stewardship concerns and preservation of open space. In 1978, the Mohonk Trust became the Mohonk Preserve. We like to consider Daniel Smiley a naturalist and the original community scientist. He had a natural curiosity of the world and frequently found himself in nature making observations. Eventually, he began recording his observations on three by five index cards, which are located in the archives of the DSRC and have been digitized through staff and volunteer efforts. Keeping these records helped preserve his observations, but it also helped him identify patterns that were revealed by his observations. The DSRC was created in 1980 and is the home for our conservation programs department. So what is conservation science at the Daniel Smiley Research Center? Our four main areas of study include ecological change, human use and history, natural history collections, and long-term environmental monitoring on the ridge. We study lakes, streams, vernal pools, birds, phenology, weather climate, and house a variety of specimens to name a few of the things we do. In the photo on the top, you can see the Elms House, which is where the Daniel Smiley Research Center is located, which is on Mohonk Mountain House grounds. The bottom photo shows Paul Huth in our archives, showing specimens to guests. Paul worked alongside Dan Smiley for many years and still participates in research at the Daniel Smiley Research Center. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit bit about weather data at the Daniel Smiley Research Center and how that understands, how that helps us understand what is going on with climate change in the world. So to identify the extent of global climate change, 
Researchers need access to reliable data covering the longest period possible. And we have that. The preserve's weather data is dependable because the station has been in the same comparatively stable location for over a century, and the same protocol has been followed by the relatively few people that are involved in, the correct, in collecting the data. What data do we collect? We collect temperature data. We take the maximum for the day, the minimum for the day, and the temperature at observation, and we take precipitation data. So what type of precipitation, whether it's rain or snow, sleet, the duration of the precipitation event, and we use a rain gauge and a snow stake to make these measurements. Previously, we used manual data collection, and today we use automated data collection. Mohonk Lake was established as a NOAA Cooperative Weather Station in 1896, and NOAA stands for National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. This lets our data be part of an extremely large data set of weather phenomena that helps researchers understand the changing climate. A little bit more about weather data at the DSRC. Displayed to the right is the weather summary that I created for December 2021. I download, extract, and input our weather data from our equipment into our database. Then I use this data to calculate the average for temperature and the totals for precipitation and snowfall if it's a month that has snow. These are compared with the averages over the 126 year period we have data for and the deviation from average is calculated. More information such as the highest and lowest temperatures for that period of time are included as well. If any of the values are exceptional, I compare them to the previous years, and if it's in the top 10 for any of the values, that is noted. Just like how Lauren was saying earlier that 2021 was one of the hottest years on record. A variety of organizations and individuals are signed up to receive these weather summaries, and you can be too. Email me at the email address listed right there. It's just padlercolvin at mohonkreserve.org to be added to the weather distribution list. You might be wondering why is all of this stuff important? So the longevity of these data sets show how temperature, precipitation, and as Lauren said earlier, even the timing of the seasons has changed over the years. As the climate changes, some species will respond. Coupling the weather data with dates of first bloom, the spring emergence of insects and amphibians, and spring arrival dates of birds illustrates how some species are responding, which Lauren will give some examples on shortly. And I'm gonna hand it back to Lauren for these next few slides. All right, yeah. So as Penny was saying, um, weather data has been collected for 126 years. So going all the way back to 1896. Um, so we do have a lot of information and that's really what we wanna look at. Remember climate is not about what's happening right now. It's the long-term data sets that we're looking at. And we're very fortunate to have had this weather data going back all the way to 1896. So it, this is one of the longest phenology records um, that is out there in the world even. So really awesome, continuously getting all this information. So here is a graph of the average daily temperature um, that was taken from Mohonk Lake, from that weather station at Mohonk Lake, um, from 1896, just until last year. Of course, it is only March, so we don't have a lot of data from this year yet. So all the way up to the end of last year. So you can see that um, the daily average temperature has been increasing. That red line there shows the trend line. So the average daily temperature has increased um, by 3.2 degrees Fahrenheit since 1896. Um, and the graph shows uh, the, for the entire record, um, you can see there the linear regression trend line is shown there in red. You can see that increase. Um, the warmest, highest temperature um, for on average was in 2020. So it was just the two years ago at 52, almost 53 degrees. The coldest year was way back in 1904. So that was the coldest average year. So again, this is not um, one cold temperature, it's the coldest average temperature over time. So we can also take a look at the top 10 warmest and the top 10 coldest years. So the warmest years are the ones that are in red. The coldest ones are in green. Maybe that should have been blue, but they're in green to represent the cold. So this, again, is going back to 1896 all the way up until last year, 2021. 
So it shows the average annual temperatures um, in which all the 10 warmest years have been since 1990. Um, and the top 10 coldest years have all occurred previous to 1959. And six of the 10 were before 1920. So you definitely see a clustering of these really warm years and these colder years. The warm years have all happened within a uh, relatively recent years since 1990, and a lot of our coldest years are kind of clustered over a hundred years ago. So here is the number of days where the temperature is at or below zero degrees Fahrenheit. So zero degrees Fahrenheit and uh, not uh, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. We're talking below zero. So at zero or below zero. So this is what's happening at the other end of the temperature spectrum. So we keep talking about climate change, global warming. We kind of interchange them. But part of climate change is that our winters are getting warmer as well. So over time, our winters are not getting as cold as they used to. And we're seeing fewer and fewer days at or below uh, zero degrees Fahrenheit. And you can definitely see that uh, since 2000, many years haven't even had a single day that reached below zero. So there's a lot of gaps that are at the end of that um, chart there where there's just no data at all because there were zero days that reached below zero degrees Fahrenheit. So how does this impact our environment? If we're, you're probably thinking, well, good, I don't like it below zero, <laughs> which I think a lot of us think, but it actually serves a purpose, especially here in the Northeast. So the hemlock woolly adelgids and the elongate hemlock scale are insects that are literally sucking the life out of hemlocks. Um, these are only killed off by extreme periods of really cold winter temperatures, like zero or below zero temperatures. So since we aren't having these long periods cold enough with these temperatures, most of the insects survive the winter. So they continue to feed on the hemlocks and many of them will, if they survive the winter, then there's more of them come the spring and summertime. So this, Hemlocks, they may survive in areas in northern New York, like in the Adirondacks, because up there, it definitely does get below zero more frequently than it does in the rest of the state. So the temperatures there are colder and they are longer periods of at zero or below zero. Um, it doesn't sound great to us, but it actually is because it's helping protect our plants. Um, it's also true for our tick population. Um, if we don't get really cold stretches in the winter, those ticks survive. A lot of the ticks survive and you've probably already noticed it's, uh, it's March now and you might already be finding ticks on you or your pets. Um, so our tick season is definitely getting longer. And of course we know that ticks carry disease like Lyme disease. Um, so our pets and ourselves are at higher risk for Lyme disease. Um, and more of ticks means there's more chances that you're going to um, get Lyme disease. All right. So I also mentioned in those 11 signs of climate change, mentioned precipitation um, and how some places are getting more precipitation and others are getting less. Um, we are not really in a drought situation here. Like you think of Australia or you think of California. We have a very slight trend to having more precipitation over time. So this is the total yearly precipitation going all the way back to 1896 up until last year. There is a lovely little spike there that you see that was actually in uh, 2011. Um, that was the most rainfall. That was almost uh, 79 inches of rainfall. Um, if you recall, if you were in this area during that time, that is when Hurricane Irene made landfall in the Hudson Valley. So that was an extreme rain event that we had. Um, and the question is, uh, how do you measure this precipitation? I know that that Penny was saying, like, this is all the data that we collect at this weather station, but how do you measure it during the winter when there's snow? <laughs> so uh, one way to measure it, to get an accurate measure of precipitation in the winter time is to slowly melt the snow that falls each day and then measure the amount of liquid that's in that. Snow has a lot of different consistencies and you've probably noticed that every winter, every storm is a little bit different. The snow falls a little bit different based on moisture content. So we, sometimes you get that really wet snow that is just really hard to shovel. And sometimes you get the light fluffy powdery stuff, which is much easier to shovel. So 
um, it's it's moisture content. That's the difference there. And, and that's how you calculate the precipitation. You can always go out with a ruler too and measure in inches how much you have, but you gotta be careful of those snow drifts. So um, precipitation records uh, weren't done consistently each day, um, starting way back in 1896. It wasn't until Dan Smiley became the weather observer in 1937 that he started collecting data consistently. So over the plus 75 plus year records, we've had an increase of over 10 inches of precipitation. So kind of put that all into perspective, on average at Mohonk, we get between three and four inches of precipitation each month on average. If we are now getting a 10 extra inches per year, it's almost as if we're getting over two additional months of precipitation. So yeah, you think about it that way, three to four inches of precipitation each month. But if we're getting an extra 10 inches, that's like adding on two months of precipitation to, to our calendar year. So we talked about getting all this weather data together and how it's impacting life on the planet um, in many different ways. And Penny's already mentioned it, phonology, it's nature's calendar. So when we think about weather, we're often thinking about the seasons. It really felt like spring a couple of weeks ago, we hit like near 70 or over 70. And then just like a crushing blow this week when it got cold again and snow flurries. But that's spring for you. That's what happens in this area. It is it is what it is here in the Northeast. Um, so phenology is the study of the seasonal and the cyclical changes in plants and animals. So in other words, it is our nature's calendar and all these things depend on the weather. The plants that are starting to come up now, they're totally adapted for this crazy spring weather where you have these really warm days and then it goes right back into winter. They are adapted for that. They've been around for millennia, so they are doing just fine. They can definitely handle these cold snaps. And I'm sure as if you're a gardener, you know that as well, that these plants come up and they still do well. So phenology is based on observations. It's an observation-based science. So we call all these observable stages or phases in the life cycle of a plant, we call them phenophases. So um, if you are to uh, get together with Penny and maybe help out with some phenology, phenophase is a term that will be used over and over again. So what are these triggers of these different phenophases? There are two different things that can trigger a phenophase or the observable life stage, like when the first shoots of your daffodils come up and when they flower and when they go to seed. Those are all different phenophases. So two things can trigger them. One is the length of the day. So the number of daylight hours or the photo period, um, and it's always the same calendar date since it's not dependent on weather. Um, it's based on the rotation and revolutions of the earth around the sun. So it doesn't have anything to do with weather and climate. It all has to do with astronomy, how our planet is moving around the sun and the rotation of it. So day length. The other thing is temperature. So this is obviously weather and climate dependent. So temperatures can change based on the weather patterns in our atmosphere. The calendar date does change based on the weather. So some years we warm up earlier in the spring and some years the winter snow comes later. I'm hoping we're not going to get any more significant snow this spring. <laughs> um, but this is something that uh, definitely can impact your garden and of course can impact a lot of our insects are pollinators as well if these temperature temperatures are changing. All right. So if you are a wonderful phenologist, you might be already observing these different changes, these different phenology things. And you're probably observing them without even realizing. I've already mentioned daffodils. I have daffodils in my yard and the um, shoots are coming up. So you kind of notice that's the sign of spring, right? You probably notice um, birds have returned. Red winged blackbirds are singing. These are all signs of spring and of course, phenology. You're making note of phenology, whether you realize it or not. So farmers, gardeners, naturalists, outdoor enthusiasts, they've long used these common visible indicators to signal these timing, this natural events um, and conditions that are happening. Like I said, you know, plants coming up and birds returning. So 
The dandelion bloom um, is, for instance, that has been used as an indicator that the ground has thought enough to plant potatoes or other crops. So if you have a vegetable garden and dandelions are up, that means the ground is thawed enough that they use time to plant in your garden. So another local uh, Hudson Valley one, um, it suggests that the shad bush, uh, when that blooms, then the shad are running up the Hudson River to breed. So there's even, you know, shad bush, also called Juneberry, even goes there with the fish, the shad. So, ah, okay, that's, that's things that are in in, co in sync with each other. So the um, other correlations alert arrival of insects um, that could harm crops. So farmers would use this one. The emergence of the forsythia flowers has been used by cabbage farmers to indicate the arrival of the adult of the cabbage root maggot, which if you're a farmer, you do not want to have happen. So you um, are get ready for preparing to uh, get rid of those cabbage root maggots um, if you see the forsythia flowers. All right, here's, um, here's a little chart of the top 10 warmest Aprils. So why in the world would we care about April? Well, April, <laughs> coming up very soon. April is really a time when spring definitely gets underway. That's when a lot of things start growing. Um, there's been a few things, as I said, a few things in March now that are popping up. But as we get through April and it gets warmer and warmer, um, a lot of our plants are going to start um, blooming and then our insects will come and of course our birds who eat those insects come and as I've already mentioned there's several migrating birds that have already returned. So um, these are the top 10 and you probably notice much like the last top 10 warmest um, years that I showed, there's a cluster in uh, the 2000s where the top 10 warmest Aprils have occurred. Um, it's all been near in the near past. There we go. That's the I almost said near future, but that's the near past. They've all been very recent. So if spring temperatures are increasing, how are all these species reacting? All species of plants are not responding in the same way, and some are not responding at all. They're, 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 we haven't noticed anything yet. But what's really being impacted are the earliest of our spring blooms. These are called spring ephemerals, um, and that means that they complete their entire life cycle, all of their phenophases, within a short amount of time, usually the spring. Um, this is an adaptation for them to take advantage of the open canopy. They can get as much light as they need because the trees haven't leafed out yet. Um, they're also taking advantage of those early insect pollinators um, that are out in the early springtime. So our uh, earliest spring ephemerals, like the bloodroot, which is the picture on the left, and the hepatica, which are the sweet little flowers there on the right, these are the strongest. Um, the bloodroot is blooming 14 days earlier on average, two weeks earlier than what has been noted on all of those wonderful little note cards that Dan Smiley was putting together. And hepatica is 20 days earlier um, blooming than what they did in the 1930s. So we are going back oh, almost 100 years for this data, but that's what you need to do when you're looking at climate change data. You have to go back a really long way to really get a good picture of what is changing, what is happening in our environment. So it's not just the flowers that are having an impact. We mentioned migrating birds. Um, so the migrating birds are responding to these warmer temperatures early in the spring and the shorter winter season. Um, a couple of them are shown here. So the ruby-throated hummingbird is, has been arriving a month and a half earlier than almost 100 years ago. The red-winged blackbird is almost three weeks earlier. So the red-winged blackbirds, I even think uh, there's been a couple, yeah, a couple of times that they've been coming um, in mid to late February. Um, so long before April comes around. The eastern towhee on average is coming back a week earlier and so is our chipping sparrow. So these are all migratory birds which are coming earlier. And again, they migrate based on the length of day, but there also might be some temperature cues that they're um, basing it off of. We also have some new year round residents in the Shawangunks for our birds. So birds that typically would migrate, maybe they don't. 
And other birds that are typically not found in this area um, are now found in this area. So they're not, they weren't here before. They weren't just migrating away. They were actually sticking around. They've come from the south and they moved up. So the American robin, uh, turkey vulture and song sparrow, the Carolina wren, the brown-headed cowbird, some of these birds will in fact stay here year round um, instead of leaving. So I know a lot of people love to see the American robin in the spring, but it's very, there's a very good chance that the robin you're seeing has been here the whole time, has been here all winter long. Some of them will migrate, but some of them also choose to stay. Um, they no longer are going to uh, migrate. And that's because they have a food source here. So if it is warmer here in the winter, they can find their food. They can still find maybe a few insects that are still out because it's super warm, or they might be finding some seeds that are there. If they have a food source, they don't need to leave. Most of these migrating birds leave the area because there's no food for them. So they're gonna go someplace south where they can find the insects that they need or nectar um, in the case of our hummingbirds. So There are some new species to Mohonk Preserve in the last 45 or so years. Um, so the raven um, was not found here. Um, it was not a very common bird found here until the 1970s. The same with the red-bellied woodpecker. Um, and then another example would be the fish crow and the black vulture. Um, they started to become more frequent and common here in the 1980s. So um, it was the black vulture, for instance, was a considered a southern species, but it's been moving north. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if it continued, if its range didn't continue to shift northwards um, even further into uh, northern New York. So as Penny mentioned, um, timing, why is this all important? Why are we like getting all of this weather data and we're talking about phenology and all of this? Um, so what happens when the flowers boom too early? The birds come back too soon. Who's going to be affected by all of this? And it's really going to be the plants and the pollinators. And of course, then it's going to be um, the non-insects, the non-pollinators non as well are going to be affected by, by the plants and the pollinators not being around because that's their food source. Um, and of course, our predator and prey relationships. So um, as I mentioned, the animals are migrating because um, they're avoiding these unfavorable conditions that we have, meaning that there's no food. So um, here's a little example of avoiding these unfavorable climatic conditions. So in March of 2012, we're going back a couple of years, um, New Paltz had a really long span, um, six con consecutive days where the temperature was in the high to mid 70s. So almost a week worth of really warm, temperatures for March. So as a result of this, the apple trees bloomed early. And of course there's apple orchards everywhere <laughs> around here. So on all those following days and weeks, in the following days and weeks, low temperatures plummeted to below freezing at night as it happens in March. Um, and it destroyed a lot of those blossoms. So with those flowers just frozen and gone, um, a lot of the local farms lost 60 to 70 percent of their apple crop that year. That's a major economic blow. It's a major food source blow for a lot of animals and people, of course. We love our apples. So this climate change is not just impacting plants and animals. It's, of course, affecting us and our economy, too. So, again, another uh, reason for animals to migrate is the availability for food and resources. Um, as I mentioned, it's the insect-eating birds they'll tend to migrate while the seed eating birds may stay through the winter because there's still some seeds for them to find. So farmers are going to be relying on insects to pollinate the crops um, and the crops must flower when pollinators have reached maturity. So the birds need to time their nesting so that their broods hatch around the same time that the insects emerge in order to ensure that there's a steady food supply for all of those hungry birds that they have, they're hungry baby birds that they have, they have to feed them. So they wanna make sure that they're timing everything just right for the most amount of food to, for their, their babies. So here's an example of how this timing can get 
can go very wrong. There's an asynchrony or this mismatch in these species interactions. Um, so this example, is a, it's a very famous example of a study that was done in the Netherlands on this bird called a pied flycatcher, which looks really cool. Um, I'm kind of bummed that we don't have it here, but it is an old world species, which means that's from the other side of the world um, in Europe and Africa. So this study was done on these nine populations of pied flycatchers. Um, the researchers studying these birds found that the populations declined by 90% in areas where there was a mismatch in the timing of the bird's arrival and how much food was available. So in the recent years of this, when the study was taking place, the English oaks um, leafed out earlier, um, all responding to the temperature. The larva of the winter moth, which is that little nondescript green um, caterpillar right there, um, also was triggered by temperature. And so that would emerge earlier as well. And of course, that is the food source for the pied flycatcher. And the English oak is the food so source for the winter moth. So the pied flycatcher is not cued by temperature, it's cued by the length of day for their migration. So they're gonna arrive at their usual time and they the going south for them is going to Northern Africa and then back to the Netherlands. So when you have this mismatch, this asynchrony of the bird, the pied flycatcher and its food source, um, it's going to mess up the reproductive cycles of it. Um, so the population is going to decline. So when the timing is off for their broods, they're not gonna have enough food to feed all of their chicks. And so not as many of them are going to um, going to survive. So this is one very famous example of this asynchrony. Um, of course, it's seen elsewhere in the world. This is an example, of course, from Europe, but it's suspected to be more widespread all around the world. And there are examples such as this one out there. Um, it's rare to really get all that information together. And it's kind of poorly understood because there's really more than just one factor for why a population would be declining any population. So it could be things like habitat loss, it could be hunting, it could be disease. There's lots of multiple factors why um, a, an animal, a plant, an insect could have a declining population. Um, but in this case, for sure, it was really looking like it's the mismatch of the timing of things. So there's still a lot of unanswered questions about this. Um, but it is definitely impacting what's happening here in our Hudson Valley as we are seeing our plants blooming earlier. We are seeing um, birds that were not year-round now being year-round and new species, plants, birds, and other animals that are here now. So we do at Mohong Preserve have a lot of things going on and that is what Penny is in charge of. So I'll let her tell you all about that. Thanks, Lauren. Yes, I am the community science coordinator, which means that a large part of my position is helping coordinate the volunteers that help out with our various projects. So there's many ways that you can help monitor climate change in Mohonk Reserve. Listed here are our community science projects, which require the help of volunteers. So I'm going to go e through each one of them and describe a little bit about what our volunteers do in each of these programs. As a Peregrine Watch volunteer, you observe the traps, Millbrook and Bonnecue cliffs using spotting scopes and binoculars for signs of peregrine falcons. And peregrine falcons are a New York State endangered species, and Mohonk Preserve works to ensure that they are protected. Bird identification experience is highly recommended. Next, the phenology project. As a volunteer for the phenology project, you monitor species at the testimonial gateway for specific phenophases. As Lauren had said earlier, those are stages in the plant life cycles. Examples of species that we monitor include sugar maple, trout lily, spring peepers, common milkweed, and New England asters. This project lends itself well to those without much experience. Our data from our monitoring here is entered into Nature's Notebook, which is a platform through the National Phenology Project that becomes part of a very, very large data set. As a Streamwatch volunteer, you observe and assess streams on the preserve within the Hudson River estuary. Volunteers monitor water quality, take measurements including temperature and pH of the water, and report on macro invertebrates and invasive species. 
At the DSRC, we also have a plethora of archival specimens and observations that we are working to digitize in order to make them more accessible to the public. This would allow for greater research to occur using our data. Volunteers that help with digitization are computer savvy and is a great option for those who might want to work indoors. Every now and then, we need volunteer assistance on special projects. For example, currently we have, we have a volunteer working on transcribing historic breeding bird census data from paper forms into Excel spreadsheets that will be much more useful and accessible in the long term. You can reach out to me to learn more about information on any of these projects and see how you can get involved in helping with conservation science on the Mohonk Preserve. Going to hand it back to Lauren now. Okay, so we've been talking a lot about, well, climate change and how, of course, it is impacting not just the world, but the Hudson Valley, um, and also ways that you can uh, help out Mohonk Preserve in collecting this data that we're using to, um, to help us make adaptations and mitigations for climate change. So some of the things that we are doing um, is trying to be more sustainable. Um, we have completed um, several of these things. It's pretty exciting um, that as part of the Climate and Sustainability Committee of Mohawk Preserve, which I'm a part of, we've been working towards um, just becoming more sustainable. So you can see that there's a few things that we've done that we've completed in 2021. And some of these things are um, pretty simple, like offering remote work options when practical to reduce the amount of fossil fuels that we're using, um, solar panels at Coxing Trailhead, so we can use those. Um, we have an electric chainsaw, which I hear works really, really well. Um, and we've enrolled in community solar electricity. A lot of these things are things that you can do yourself. <laughs> so that's pretty great research into some of these things. We do, of course, have other goals that we're working on, these short-term actions that we have, of course, holding low-waste events, offering more programs like this, Leave No Trace programs, um, climate change programs. Um, and we want to really communicate with um, our audiences, so people who are coming to visit us through signage and communications about, about ways that we're being sustainable and how you can be more sustainable. Something really simple as um, purchasing some more sustainable cleaning products, and installing LED light bulbs, that's totally something that you can do. Um, and we're trying to reduce the number of single use paper maps and we're really promoting our digital map. Um, so we're saving trees that way. Um, trees are really great um, carbon uh, sources. They're really great carbon sinks. They store a lot of carbon in their trunks. So the more trees we have, of course, then the more carbon from the atmosphere is stored and not left out in the atmosphere. That's what's causing a lot of our climate change issues. Of course, there's a big pie in the sky things um, that we are looking to do, having an electric fleet for us, having charging stations at the preserve for everybody. Um, we're really working on enhancing our carbon sequestration capacity. We have a climate change intern, um, uh, Raina Berger, who was one of the presenters on the virtual climate change panel. She uh, was helping us assess our land. And really we have to have a baseline before we can make any changes. If you wanna know more about that, definitely check out the virtual climate change panel webinar, which is on our website. Um, so you can check that out and hear more about all of that. And of course, coming up with a climate action plan with targets, metrics, systems for evaluating all of that good stuff is all part of us collecting this data, seeing where we're at, where our baseline is, and seeing how we can improve. And you can do this for yourself as well. Do a little at home audit for um, your household, see what your baseline is and where you can improve. And it really could be something as simple as changing out your light bulbs to LED light bulbs, having more sustainable cleaning products, composting more, planting pollinator gardens, all of that great stuff. The littlest things add up to big things when um, we're all doing it together and having a little safe haven for these animals and plants in your neck of the woods is a bonus too. All right, there we go. If you do have any questions at all, um, if you're interested in any of the community science programs that Penny mentioned, um, there's her email address, please do contact her. And of course you can always contact me. I can talk about climate change education and all of that great stuff for a long time as you've now discovered. Um, 
<laughs> I can do this for a very long time. Um, so I do encourage you to reach out to us. Um, and I'm also going to open it up now to any questions that you may have. So if you want to put it in the chat or if you would like to just directly talk to us, you can click the speak button. Don't be shy. I'm happy to answer stuff. <laughs> And I do want to thank everyone for, for coming uh, this evening um, to, to just take some time out of your Tuesday evening to listen about climate change, which isn't exactly a happy, happy topic. But I'm hoping that there's we've offered a little bit of, yes, I can do something at the end of all of this. It's not all depressing. <laughs> and hope that like you can do something by uh, volunteering your time through the community science programs. That's always good, too lots of things to do. <laughs> no questions. It's a quiet audience. It looks like we're getting some requests to speak. Ooh, we have a request ah, from Ben and Gretchen. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. It'll be take just a moment, but Gretchen is going to be joining us. should happen soon. <laughs> okay. And I see Ben would also like a question, so I'll I'll accept. <laughs> yeah. And they will show up. I'm never sure how that works on their end if they need to like do a little something, but we'll we'll see. <laughs> hmm? Oh, there we go. Looks like Ben is joining us. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Um, I didn't realize it would be a, a thing to, to get into the room, but thanks. And I, since it was just a few of us, I wanted to thank you guys um, really so much for, for the really well put together presentation. Um, it's so impressive to hear the length of, of data that you guys have and really all that you're doing. I mean, personally, um, you know, as far as Mohonk goes, like I've only come and walk the trails and they're lovely and it's so nice to uh, have previously worked in, in climate change back in DC in a former life and it's really nice to to see uh, how much you guys are doing with the data and, and resources that you have um, I, I, I so uh, obviously Mohonk is is up in the mountains um, and the you know everything you went over the the new species and and the phenology uh, changes those are are all um, really interesting. Um, I, I just was curious um, since we are in the Hudson Valley, um, do you guys have much information on what's happening like with the marshlands and and anything with Hudson River? Um, so the changes in precipitation. Um, and, and all that, are they, how are they affecting the marshlands? I know those are really important, especially for the uh, migratory fly, fly zones. Sure, you know, we're not, um, our property is not in a riparian zone. We're not right next to the Hudson River. Yeah, so. I, I, I knew I was asking a little bit out of the expertise <laughs> zone. That's but. okay. Um, there's got to be um, resources out there in the Hudson Valley of uh, places that are keeping track of this information. Um, you can always look to the DEC and our local DEC in the Hudson Valley region to see what they have. Um, and yeah, there's, there's a lot Lot of organizations that I'm sure have been keeping records. We're very fortunate that we have these records going back to the 1800s, right? It's, yeah, it's pretty right. phenomenal that we have this long range data. Um, but other places, of course, have been keeping um, records, just not nearly for as long. So that other places have been seeing changes as well. And of course, the changes with the marshlands, um, 
with sea level rise, there are actually places uh, within the Hudson Valley, the lower Hudson Valley, that are kind of already seeing some of these impacts of sea level rise, where they're actually losing some of their marshlands because they're becoming underwater. The tides are becoming more severe. Um, the high tides, because of sea level rise, are, are coming, the, the big th uh, tides are becoming more and more severe. So we're losing more and more of that. And of course, those wetlands are important nesting and stopover areas for migratory yep. birds. So, so yeah, you get, you get all kinds of stuff going on with that. And I wish I had like the actual names of the places for you to look up, but I know that they're out there and uh, I think start with the DEC and see if you can. Uh, I know Cena Hudson is, is yep. really involved in, in there as well. And I've been trying to get, um, uh, they offer some uh, volunteer opportunities, um, uh, but the volunteer opportunities that that some Penny it sounds like you're organizing um, some uh, really well well put together a lot of really good programming um, it sounds there. Um, I, I'm waitlisted for the I uh, for for your walk coming up this Sunday. So fingers crossed, maybe a, another spot would open up. Fingers Please. crossed, definitely. We'd love to have you there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, I, I hope so too. There's always there's always a few people that's like, oh, we just can't make it, and they let me know. So I'll let you know if there's a spot open. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any other questions? Um, uh, not right now. I I, I I guess I mean I don't want to take up too much of your time. It's it's a bit late in the evening, and I didn't know if Gretchen had a question as well. I think she's, I think she's gone. <laughs> we lost, we lost Gretchen. You lost oh, Gretchen. That's yes, that's okay. Well, if you do have any further questions, you can well, always. There was, there was one other thing okay. that I was just curious about. So you mentioned the precipitation hadn't uh, increased nearly as dramatically as the local weather. Um, uh, you are getting more precipitation. How much do you look at the ratio of precipitation type? So ratio between rain and snow. Oh, that's a really great question. I know in that weather data, and Penny, maybe you can elaborate on it, um, there is precipitation, and then there's also like the amount of snowfall, like what has been noticed in the last, since the last time the readings were taken, the 24 hour period. So maybe Penny, can you elaborate a little bit more? Yeah, so we have our automatic rain gauge where it collects mm -hmm. all of the water into, you know, a rain gauge that it then records the level of it. And we also have a trail camera set up pointing at a snow stake. So we take the data for the precipitation that occurs. And then what I do for the months where there is snowfall, I download all of the pictures from the trail camera, kind of click through and see where the accumulation is. And based off of those photos, I determine the snowfall and the snow accumulation. So we do have just separate data values for okay. precipitation, for snowfall and for snow depth. That's, oh, that is so incredible. <laughs> yeah, and if, you want, if you want to learn more about that or any more of our other volunteer opportunities or just talk about the data, you can absolutely reach out to myself and or Lauren. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, uh, I, I think, um, like I say, hopefully I'll have the chance to to actually meet you on, on Sunday and, and plenty of time to talk then. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us this evening. And I'll, you know, there's just us here now. I'm going to thank everybody else for joining us too. I, I really love yeah. that um, people can engage this way and, and I hope more people are going to sign on for community science projects. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll raise my hand. So thank you guys so much for putting this on. I uh, really appreciate your time. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for Have coming. Have a great rest of your night. Yeah. Thank you. you. See you later. Bye.